Just come off the phone uh, with Patrick Holford. He's going to be joining us in a moment and he's got some hot, hot news around COVID. So make sure you stay tuned. Good morning. Welcome. Or if you're on a repeat, good afternoon or good evening or whenever you're watching. Great to have you to the show. My name's Steve Bennett, your host. Uh, today I'm joined by Patrick Holford, who is uh, an award winning author. He's written over 40 books and yesterday launched his latest book, uh, Flu Fighters, which I downloaded earlier this morning. And uh, because I was up quite early, got about a third of the way through, it is a fascinating read. Uh, it's called it Flu Fighters, I, I guess because if you called it COVID, it would have got blocked everywhere. But so much fantastic advice about bolstering the immune system and our defenses. And if you can download that book today, it really is, I won't say life changing, but absolutely instrumental in understanding how to best boost your immune system. It's a fantastic book. If you're new to the program, nice to have you along. Please tell everybody, if you're a regular, make sure you give it the thumbs up, because I keep forgetting all these things, because I'm really new to social media. So I'm supposed to say every time, give it a thin thumbs up, if you could, that'd be great. Give it a share, tell somebody else about it so we get more people to the program. And the more comments you can do during and questions during and after that helps us as well because we want to raise the profile of the show because at the end of the day, we want to get the word out about how to live as healthy as possible with our brilliant, brilliant guests. Also at the same time, we're trying to raise money for the Trussell Trust, uh, which is the food bank company, uh, charity, not company, sorry, that run over 1,200 food banks across the UK and more than ever, they need our support because there are people going hungry in the UK today. And we need to support them because there are more people going hungry in the UK today because of the virus. So anything we can do, dropping off food into those collection uh, boxes in the supermarkets would be fantastic. Uh, or make a donation with the, oh, <laughs> the text of, one day I'm gonna get this right, uh, with the text number, if you can text a small donation, it'd be absolutely fantastic. Or uh, go to our Just Giving page, type in The Food Bank Show, and uh, if you can make just a small donation, that would be really, really kind, because we want to make sure that everybody has got a meal uh, this evening across the UK. Uh, every day we also give you a food fact because we're having a competition and we say simply this, write down each day as many food facts as you can remember, just the title will do, and when we eventually come out of lockdown, I don't know, two, three, four weeks from there, whenever that might be, whoever can remember the most food facts, and you can always go back to yesterday's show and sort of scroll through till you find the big green box, a little tip there, um, then um, we've got a competition, £1,000 worth of three uh, jewellery, or you can come uh, to lovely sunny Warwickshire, which hopefully it will be in the summer, stay at a boutique hotel, and Jack, myself, Poppy and Nick, uh, who are putting the show together every day, uh, will take you out for a meal. You're probably going to want the other prize, though, I would have thought. And there's Jack, my son, driving the show today. He's on his lonesome own some because the other children are doing <laughs> other things. Uh, this morning. Uh, and also on the things, one of the things we're really, really working hard on on the show is to look at the positives. What might life look like post COVID? And last night, uh, lovely Tom Watson uh, phoned my family up and we were talking to Tom and he was saying, you know, he's doing things now that he's never done before. He's working in, you know, in his allotment. He's got his beetroots that he's working on. He said, look, you know, hopefully try and encourage everybody to get into new things, find new hobbies and uh, and, and really get something to get interested in. So maybe we'll get new hobbies, maybe we'll start working from home a lot more, which will have a great positive effect uh, on the environment. So there are some positives, let's try and stay with the positives. But today's show, let's get straight on to it. Uh, did we get the uh, slide up a second ago, Jack, for the oh, food fact? I can get, I'll get it up now. Ah, oh, he's slipping. I mean, I just promoted it, promoted it, promoted it. There it is. Today's food fact is oily fish. Oily fish, I have uh, six that I'm really, really particularly fond of because all of them are rich in omega. They're virtually, if not totally, carb-free. Um, just take one Cornish sardine, for example. It delivers so much in terms of vitamins, in terms of omega-3, in terms of vitamin D and so on, in just one sardine. Oily fish are absolutely super for our health. Take today's food fat, write down oily fish, 
enter our competition would be great. And uh, do give us lots of your questions today as we are live. That would be great to have you joining us uh, because we want to make this a truly, truly interactive show. Right, I've got my vitamin C ready. Uh, and I have to have my vitamin C ready because the man that knows probably more about vitamin C than anybody is joining us on the line. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Steve. How are you doing? We are doing very well. I bet you've hardly had any sleep again doing all this research on what's happening. I've been on the, on, on the phone to New Zealand where they're really hot on vitamin C and also to China. Uh, unfortunately, their day is my night, so you're right, not much sleep. By the way, I've turned my mobile phone off for the purpose of this interview, but the second it's over, I am texting Primal20. I want to stick 20 quid into the food bank because the single biggest thing that's going to affect your immune system, more than vaccines, more than drugs, is actually your nutrition, your food. Yeah. And somehow this entire conversation about food, nutrients, vitamin D, vitamin C, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. I've actually been given a lot of information since we last spoke, uh, and I've been given all the minutes of the official groups deciding on policy. Going back a few years, uh, they even said to get ready for a pandemic, we've got to get enough drugs for 90% of the population. I have no idea what drug they're talking about because there isn't, there isn't one that actually works. Yeah. And uh, in all the minutes and all the briefings and all the statements through the NHS, et cetera, on, on strategy, how to prevent, I've just done a very simple thing. I've searched on um, uh, five words, uh, nutrition is one, uh, vitamin is another, ascorbic, because that vitamin C, vitamin D, kind of ascorbic is vitamin C, ascorbic. I've searched on sunlight uh, and I've searched on sugar and I've searched on carbs, and I have not yet found a single government NHS strategy document anywhere that mentions that word once, just once. It's frightening, it's upsetting, it's absurd, it's frustrating. I, again, did something very, very similarly. I was talking to my PR agency yesterday and said, how's it going, being able to promote our show? They said, you know, we've got a bit of mentions for you on some radios for the food bank. I said, what about getting the message out that the best defense mechanism uh, after uh, washing our hands and social distancing is eating real food? They went, no, nobody's interested to talk about it. No media is interested to talk about things we could all be doing to make ourselves safer. It's ridiculous. And then my first advertising standards complaint I got yesterday in years and years and years they complained about something I put on Facebook that wasn't even an advert. I don't know if you saw my photograph. I was holding, it wasn't an advert, I was holding a tube of vitamin C and yeah. a face mask. Yeah. And all I was asking everybody was, which gives you the best protection? It wasn't advertising anything. And then the advertising standards slammed me down for saying, that's a, that's a false advert. It wasn't an advert. It was well, a question. <laughs> so it's I've been, I've been I've been done or, or had up in front of the ASA, which by the way stands for truth, you know, honesty, blah blah blah, whatever. Um, apparently, and the first time it was because I said uh, it's a myth that you can get all the vitamins you need from a well-balanced diet, and I was saying this was a few years ago. You have to supplement vitamin D in the winter. And I was clobbered because the law is you cannot say that you cannot get all the nutrients you need. When the government announced two years ago that everyone has to supplement vitamin D in the winter, I was thinking that I should report them to the Advertising Standards Agency. Right. Now, here's the next thing, because I'm going to ask you a question here just before we kick off into you okay. know, COVID land. Um, do you know omega-3 is incredibly important? 98% of the structural fat of your brain is made from one kind of omega-3, which is called DHA. And by the way, unfortunately, black seeds, chia seeds, wonderful foods, I eat them all the time. The conversion of the type of omega-3 in flax and chia into DHA is 0.05%. So, so you can't build a healthy brain without a direct source of DHA. Do you know which food has the highest amount of DHA? Uh, I'm going to say oily fish or well, yeah, a you, good steak. You've got to be more specific. You know, is there a oh, fish? Okay. okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Um, fresh water salmon. No, it's caviar. Really? Caviar is absolutely by far the highest source of DHA. 
So it's interesting, isn't it? That, you yeah. know, caviar has this association with being a very prime food. And, um, you know, I probably would get uh, clobbered like Marie Antoinette, let them eat caviar, you know? Yeah. What we did at Oxford University is um, with Professor David Smith, is he did a study where he took people with pre-Alzheimer's and he gave them high doses of B vitamins, especially B12, because older people do not absorb B12. And he also measured their omega-3 level. And if they had sufficient omega-3 in their blood and were given the vitamins versus placebo, uh, in one year they had 73% less shrinkage of their brain and no yeah. further memory loss. In other words, wow. um, and by the way, this is terribly important because it relates to vitamin C, you cannot get enough B12 in your diet if you are an older person uh, because you are probably going to be malabsorbing it. You absorb yeah. less. Mm -hmm. and, the, and therefore you have to supplement. And this is a great big myth. I, I love all the foodies who are against carbs and cut down sugar and all the rest of it. Totally support that, totally endorse it. But a lot of them, they don't know anything about vitamins and minerals. And, you know, they sort of in a mindset, as long as you eat real food, everything is okay. And that is not true for B12 and preventing dementia. And it is not true for vitamin C and fighting flu. Yeah, in fact, last night I interviewed the incredible Dr. Sean Baker, who, is the, who wrote The Carnivore Diet, and he was saying very much the same thing, that if you don't eat meat, where on earth is your B12 coming from? Because we don't get a lot from plants, and certainly as we get older, he said we should see more and more meat eaters rather than vegetarians as we get into our later years, because, like you say, we just can't absorb properly B12, so we need as much as we can get. Well, even if you eat meat and you're, and you're older, the chances are you know, a significant proportion. I mean, basically two in five people over 60 do not have an adequate B12 in their blood and they could eat all the meat they like, they still wouldn't. You can be a healthy vegan. Mm -hmm. uh, however, you have to supplement vitamin B12 and really you have to supplement DHA. And yeah. fortunately now DHA can be processed or made from seaweed. It's not in seaweed in sufficient quantities, so you actually have to supplement it. So, yeah. you, you know, however you're inclined, carnivore, vegan, everything in between, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, 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 a vegan. Uh, I'm a sort of fish-eating vegan. Mm -hmm. I very rarely eat meat. Um, and uh, my son, actually, he has, uh, um, he does rare breed pigs. Okay. So got these super healthy, fit animals, you know. And yeah. I must admit, every now and again, I mean, I have one of his uh, sausages or bacon. It's called Forest Corpit Farm. I should send you a packet, actually. That would be kind. Love it. But generally, I eat meat maybe, you know, 12 times a year, something like that. I, I uh, this morning woke up um, to a text from one of my local doctor friends, Dr. Dan Mags, who's been on the show. I told him a couple of days ago I couldn't get cauliflower, and I woke up and there were two big cauliflowers on my doorstep this morning, which was really kind of him. Right, let's get back to vitamin C. What's happening in the world of uh, Patrick Holford? You've been talking to the Chinese, you've been talking to doctors in New Zealand. What's the latest on the battle against COVID in terms of well, what can we be doing? I mean, just a very quick recap, because, you know, we mustn't assume that everyone's seen the other programs, but honestly, it'd be very good to watch all of these programs in sequence. Uh, the big news last time was that we got the results of the first ever what we call randomized controlled trial. Effectively, two groups of seriously ill people in ICU on ventilators. Half of them were given intravenous vitamin C. Uh, 12 grams twice a day. One gram is 20 oranges worth, so 24 grams a day. You know, that is a 480 oranges, I guess. A lot. You know, so <laughs> you're not going to eat it. The other group had saline water in their drip, so that was the control. And uh, what we revealed, uh, because this is, you know, really breaking news, which I have actually since then um, emailed to every single health editor, every single decision maker in the NHS, and, uh, and well, I, I would say none of them have replied. Actually, one of them did reply. Uh, the Telegraph replied and said, we'll wait for phase two of the trial. And, and there isn't a phase two. You know, <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about. This yeah. is the trial. And what happened, bottom line, is that 25% uh, of people in taking the vitamin C died, compared, sorry, 24%, compared to 35% on the placebo in effect. That was a 
31.5% or one third less deaths, significant reduction in inflammatory markers, significant reduction in time on ventilators. Now, and, and, and just stop you, this was a double blind test, so not even the doctors knew what they were uh, injecting because with exactly. a, otherwise you get blurry outcome, completely yes. blind. So the, the patient didn't know, the doctor didn't know, so a proper, proper blind test. This is the highest standard, absolutely the highest standard, and Dr. Peng, who conducted this at the Zongnan Hospital in Wuhan, where they give all their hospital workers two grams of vitamin C every day, where they give anyone coming into hospital between six and 24 grams orally, which is like a gram an hour, which is what I would instantly give to anyone. Um, that, that's uh, what they do. He wanted to break the study and reveal the results early. They had to stop the study earlier. They're slightly under on the numbers they wanted. And the reason is they've run out of patience. They've got no, I don't mean that's with a TS on the end, not CE. <laughs> They, they have no more. For the last two weeks, they've had no one in ICU. So we've got a country right now, Wuhan, yep. which is you know, the first place to be seriously hit. They've got no one to treat. Uh, they ship 50 tons in, of vitamin C into Wuhan. The public are taking it. The hospital staff are taking it. Every hospitalized patient is taking it. Um, people in serious condition are given intravenous vitamin C. And in Britain, among all our health authorities, they don't even understand what vitamin is, you know, it's as simple as that. Now, meanwhile, I've been in touch with probably the most effective ICU unit uh, in the world in the sense that this is where I would go if I, I had problems under Professor Paul Marrick, and he is Professor of Critical Care at uh, East Virginia Medical School. Uh, he gets phenomenal results. He doesn't just use vitamin C, vitamin D is important, zinc's important. You know, we may talk about those a bit. And we could also touch on some of the interesting, you know, drugs that are being used, like the malaria drugs and, 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 and so on. But what he's been, what he has shown uh, in his patients in the, in the worst situation where you get, you might have heard this word, the cytokine storm, uh, where you get this massive overreaction of the immune system, which can kill you. And this is what kills people in sepsis, um, which is a bacterial infection usually, and it actually accounts for one in five deaths in the world. Wow. Uh, it's, it's absolutely massive. And uh, basically, when this final process is occurring, the immune system consumes, uses up, spends vitamin C at a phenomenal rate because vitamin C is an antioxidant, it's anti-inflammatory, it's immune boosting. Uh, the immune system needs tons of it. And basically, he has been measuring levels of vitamin C in people in this stage um, that is below the level that would diagnose scurvy, scurvy okay. serious vitamin C deficiency. So, you know, if you knew nothing else, if you knew that people in serious respiratory distress with COVID-19 actually had levels of vitamin C that would diagnose them as scurvy. And by the way, people who die of scurvy die generally of pneumonia which mm -hmm. is what this is, yeah. that alone, that alone would tell you that you have got to be giving vitamin C. And if you're not giving vitamin C for somebody with effectively serious deficiency of vitamin C, I mean, if you, if you knew it, that basically is malpractice. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I mean, there is no drug yet. And uh, I've always said this, that with vitamin C, if it was a patentable drug, they would claim it to be the best super drug ever made by big pharmaceutical companies ever. But because it's not patentable, nobody really talks about it. And I, I, I'm with you. You know, if there's evidence already out there, it's criminal that we're not using it for patients that are, that are, that are in the hospital. Um, well, I mean, to, to put it into context, I got the report. I get it every week from the um, uh, Intensive Care National Audit and Research Team. And uh, they are saying that once somebody is on a ventilator, uh, their, the survival rate in the UK is uh, very low. One third survive, two thirds die, 66% die. And uh, what I just told you uh, was in this study in China, 25% on the vitamin C die. Yeah. So that's the difference that we're talking about. And, you know, we, we are stressing the NHS out and all the staff and all the IC units and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, and what we have to look at is why are our results among the worst on Worldometer, 
um, our, our, our recovery rate is among the worst. So why aren't we looking to the countries that have a high recovery rate? It does not make sense, you know, to be doing it like that. And I also want to say here, by the way, in this report, it shows that 13% of ICU units in Britain have not one single COVID-19 patient in them. And the Nightingale Hospital, you know, which took over the Excel Conference Centre in London uh, with 2,900 beds uh, for this apparent, you know, massive pandemic. Uh, it's got, I believe, 15 patients, maybe 18 now. Mm -hmm. So there's still plenty of capacity in the NHS, but we wouldn't even need that capacity if we just took the steps, uh, A, to get people taking two grams, I mean, I, I, well, at least I take two grams of vitamin C every day. If you get sick, take a gram an hour or at least six grams. If you're in hospital, yes, and thank you for showing this. So we have had loads of GPs contacting us saying we have to protect our NHS with vitamin C, C for UK. So we have a campaign running now on uh, change.org slash vitamin C for UK. We want the NHS to, we want the, the staff of the NHS to be protected. We want the patients in hospital to be protected. And what I've been working on is how to set up a study in, in a care home. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one sort of initiative that a group of people are working on. What we really want is for uh, the NHS, just all we need is one willing hospital ICU unit to use the same protocol in China. Uh, it's incredibly safe. That's terribly important. They had not one safety issue. It's incredibly cheap. We can do all of what we're talking about here, give everybody well, vitamin C for the cost of one ventilator. So, so two things there, Patrick. Uh, change.org uh, is, is a, cam a, a, a website that people go to to um, campaign for things and change.org forward slash vitamin c you've set up a uh, forward uh, slash vitamin c for uk okay so forward slash vitamin c for uk uh, and if people say look yes i get this i want to just all you've got it doesn't cost anything you just go in and say i register my support here and once we get to a certain amount, then the government have to take notice to that. Because also you said to me the other day that uh, there's a company in Scotland that can make vitamin C so cost effective that we could probably look after all our nurses, all our doctors and all the patients at the moment for about the same price as one vent ventilator, uh, which means it's not a cost issue. Um, it's not a supply chain issue. It's just getting people to wake up and, and, and listen to these results. Uh, well, yeah, but I think there's a massive lobby to stop this happening. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, unfortunately, you know, most people don't realize this, that there's a lot of money to be made out of vaccines and there's a lot of money to be made out of patentable drugs, but there's no money to be made out of something that is not patentable. Now, vitamin C is not patentable, but also you might have heard um, Trump banging on about this drug called hydroxychloroquine. Uh, it's actually a malaria drug. Now, I don't agree with an awful lot of what Trump says, but actually this drug is, does have some, some benefit. And um, one of the reasons, one of the things we found out is the three nutrients that have the single biggest effect, both to prevent you getting an infection and to shorten its duration and severity, and also in people who have serious respiratory distress with COVID-19 is vitamin C, zinc, and vitamin D. And uh, we know zinc is profoundly antiviral. The trouble is you have to get it into a cell. It turns out that this malaria drug, because that's what it is, helps to get zinc inside cells. Right. So the combination of this drug with zinc, um, uh, at, you know, I mean, the drug has side effects. But here's the thing. This is an old drug. So that means its patent has run out. Uh, which means there's no profit in it, oh. right? So if you were, I mean, you know, it, let me just take the position of, you know, let's imagine that all I wanted to do was make loads of money out of this, right? Yep. If that was the case, then um, um, I, you know, and vaccines is where the money is, by the way, uh, then what I would want to do definitely is to kill off vitamin C and to kill off hydroxychloroquine. So what I found yesterday uh, somebody leaked this to me. It's very, very interesting. And I'm just going to tell everyone this, but, you know, really to wake up. 
But this is a study that's been posted on the National Institute of Health proper clinical trial um, thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a trial that's actually funded by the Gates Foundation, who seem to have a lot of interest in vaccines. I'll, I'll say no more than that. And what they're doing in this trial um, is they're taking uh, uh, 1,222 people um, working in hospitals, so in other words, at relatively high risk, and they're giving them, um, they're giving one group um, this drug, hydroxychloroquine, which is meant to be given at 400 milligrams a day, and they're giving 400 milligrams a week. Oh. Right? So I checked this out with my uh, friends and professors of pharmacology. They said completely useless dose, number one. The other group are taking vitamin C one gram a day, which really won't, it won't stop severity of symptoms or anything else. The end point, in other words, the purpose of this trial, what it's measuring is how many of these people um, become antibody positive, number one, and number two, how many end up in hospital with, with COVID. Now, it's a totally useless study because there's no placebo, there's yeah. no control group. Yeah. So, so you know, if, you would never know, you know, if a certain percentage end up in hospital, you, you know, you wouldn't know. And if you compare it to the drug, I mean, basically, what I realize is this is this trial has only one function to okay. disprove, disprove, which is to create a headline <laughs> yeah. that says neither vitamin C nor this drug works. It's mm. a useless trial. Um, I have no idea why it's being done, it, unless... Yeah, it, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and that's, that's how dirty this game really is. Yeah, you know? well, tomorrow uh, I've got um, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick on for the whole show, and we're gonna, the whole thing's going to be called Doctoring Data, because yes. he's written a book on this, and, and you know, people need to know about those headlines and, and why somebody would do a study to disprove a drug that doesn't have a patent, to disprove a vitamin that doesn't have a patent, uh, because then if you can slam that door shut, that means we have all got to wait for a vaccine, and then vaccines are patentable, and vaccines do make the pharmaceutical companies lots and lots and lots of money. So uh, it's horrendous that in a time like this, Big companies are still putting profits ahead of uh, public health. You know, they're putting corporate wealth over public health, and it just makes me angry. Let's, let's talk about vaccines. How about that? Let's do that. Let's talk about vaccines. And by the way, I've got loads of questions for you, and questions coming in live, and also questions from uh, the last couple of days. So let's talk vaccines, and then let's, let's go and ask the public what they want to know. Okay. Well, first of all, we are talking about flu here. So COVID-19 is a flu. So what I've, I'm actually looking on my computer here, the, the, the best type of research is called a systematic review of meta-analysis where you look at all of the studies and it's done by what's called the Cochrane collaboration. So anyone in science knows that that's really good. So I'm looking at the latest um, Cochrane collaboration of all studies on influenza vaccine. Mm -hmm. And this is what it says. It says, there is no effect on hospitalization. In other words, it doesn't keep more people out of hospitals. There's no evidence that vaccines prevent viral transmission or complications. I'm only reading its words, it's not me. Yeah. Um, it then says the scientific evidence seems to discourage the utilization of vaccination against influenza in healthy adults as a routine public health measure. Now, let's assume that, you know, that was actually in 2010. Let's assume the vaccines have got better and so on. Now, in my age group last year, it looks like the flu vaccine um, was 30 something percent effective. In other words, one third of people having it will have a benefit, two thirds won't. The year before, if you looked at 70 plus year olds, it was 10 percent effective. In other words, nine people, if you exposed, if 10 people were exposed to a flu, one of them would have a benefit. So the first thing to realize, number one, is that vaccines are not 100% successful. Mm -hmm. uh, that's point one. Point two um, is, is, you know, if you ask the very simple question, which is we've had 11 viral epidemics this century so far, you know, we're talking Ebola and swine flu and MERS and SARS and so we had 11 of them. Um, which one of them has been curtailed by a vaccine? And the answer is absolutely none. Simple as that. Um, there was one that uh, seemed like it could be, which was the swine flu vaccine. And this vaccine was withdrawn 
because it caused uh, narcolepsy in children, which is a condition where you just completely zonk out. You know, effectively, you're falling asleep all over the place. There is also another unfortunate side effect, which is that some vaccinated people, when re-exposed to the flu, uh, actually got worse, not better. So, wow. you know, that happens. So the, the closest we've got at the moment is an Ebola vaccine. We're five years on from the outbreak of Ebola. So I thought I would look up on what's the latest status of the Ebola vaccine, which I knew was going through safety trials. So I looked up this morning, I'm looking at it right now, the expert vaccine review on Ebola and the conclusion, um, and you have to slightly read between these words, is despite obvious progress and promise, promising success with the Ebola vaccine, development, many shortcomings and challenges remain to be tackled. In other words, even this five years on hasn't ticked all the safety boxes. So I am extremely worried and I'm not against vaccines. You know, if you have a vaccine like smallpox that works, fantastic, we should all do it. But I'm extremely worried that in the interest of either making money or being seen to be doing something, a COVID-19 vaccine is rushed out before proper safety checks. And of course, there are frightened, hypnotized and gullible people who would no doubt rush out and have the vaccine before safety trials are completed. The reality is uh, we are not going to have a vaccine that's gone through safety trials properly um, for at least two years. It could be worse than that, though, Patrick, rather than I mean, you're right. People might rush out and go, oh, I need it. I need it. It might be worse than that. It might become mandatory. We might not be allowed to go to work. We might not be allowed to go on the tube or to the gym or to the restaurant until we can maybe, like a driving license, go, look, we've had it. And, and, it, and if that's the case, who knows? I think what, what you're well, trying to... I think there's put... absolutely no way that anyone is going to put a vaccine in me without my consent. As simple as that. And uh, even though they are trying to pass a corona bill, which interestingly for Scots out there, you know, listen to this. It says that vaccines can be mandatory in Scotland if the if the ministers so approve it. Nothing about the UK. But the point is, you don't make a vaccine mandatory. And in fact, this piece of legislation says all vaccines, right? You don't make a, a vaccine mandatory until, number one, you have the vaccine, you know? Yeah. Uh, number two, you've proven that it works, efficacy. And number three, you've proven that it's safe. Now, if you've yeah. done all of those things, and by the way, you've not only done them so that you, the you know, the medical group are satisfied, but really you've got to convince the public as well. Yeah. Because it's our health. We've never had this line of a compulsory medication. You don't have to take statins. You don't have to take diabetes drugs. You know, they're prescribed to you, but you still have a choice. Well, as, so, a, as a parent, though, I've had to have all my children have all the jabs at school, have I not, over the years? Or was that not mandatory? It certainly felt mandatory. No. It's not oh, well. mandatory. It's not oh, well. mandatory. I mean, a private school could choose to have that line, but no, it's absolutely not mandatory at this point in time. And I don't think, I think that's a very, very, uh, you know, important and dangerous line to cross in terms of our actual, you know, freedoms and liberties. Now, on the other hand, if you have something like smallpox and if you find this is really working and if you need a global strategy and you've crossed all those boxes, fantastic. But the big problem here is that, um, I, unfortunately, what I've been doing is I've been looking inside all these um, uh, eminent um, expert panels. And I've, been, I've just been seeing, you know, who funds them, what's their background, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, and, you know, you, you just follow it through and it's drug company, drug company, drug yeah. company, vaccine maker, vaccine maker, vaccine maker. Now, normally in science, when you publish a paper and, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you have to declare your conflicts of interest. So I, 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 for example, will declare right now that there is a company that makes a vitamin with my name on it and I get 5%, right? Uh, and I also sell books and I get royalties on that. So that, that's my conflict of interest. So that's what you have to do when you publish science. But we have all these experts standing up on television, and I'm talking about the ones that stand up on those little podiums, and they're not declaring their conflicts of interest. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And, um, and as a consequence, if you think that it's these experts who have um, 
you know, commercial associations with makers of vaccines. Yeah. They are paid by makers of vaccines, be it as a consultant or whatever. And, um, you know, this is, this is absolutely not right. And the reason, by the way, and again, you know, I'm not a fan of Trump. Uh, uh, however, the reason why Trump dumped the WHO this week, uh, or at least has suspended their funding, is, is, is to do with this. Because the WHO have made a massive big mistake. They've been fed the data on vitamin C from China. They've been fed all the studies. They have a long list of drugs they consider valid to uh, trial, and they have left vitamin C off there. Uh, in this context, they are absolutely not doing it on the basis of the scientific evidence. And when we have this sort of um, manipulation, if you like, on the organizations that we want to trust, yeah. you know, we want to trust our government, we want to trust our chief medical officer, we want to trust the WHO, but if they're in bed with, um, yeah. you know, makers of drugs, vaccines, or even vitamins or whatever it is, you know, um, then that, that makes that not valid. So I think it's terribly important. Yeah. People have been really scared. Um, you know, we were told there were going to be half a million deaths. I'd love to talk about the death numbers because they're interested. Interesting. We were told this. We were really scared. We were told the only way out was a vaccine, and uh, you know, it's this is this is really not true. What we're seeing right now is that the money sharks are circling, and they are not going to let any non-patentable alternative uh, alternatives in for the feast. Great message, brilliant message. Um, and I think what we take from that, you're not anti-vaccines because we know there are some vaccines that have been life-saving and life-changing for our generation, but we're anti-vaccines that haven't been tested properly. We're, we're saying there haven't yet been a vaccine for anything relating to influenza that's been efficient. Um, and we're saying that big pharma, big corporate interest seems to be coming first at the moment uh, and they're putting us off uh, they're doing some research to try and say that vitamins don't work um, and we have a different view on that can we ask, answer some questions We've got so many great questions for you um, and this is a really good one to start off with why can't we just use antibiotics for covid19 okay um, antibiotics work for a, a bacterial infection so when i mentioned sepsis that's a, a bacterial infection uh, this is not a bacterial infection, it's a viral infection. Uh, so it's not going to help at all. However, in the later stages, you know, when you're coughing and spluttering and basically develop pneumonia and your lungs are in a terrible way, you can very, very often develop a secondary bacterial infection as well. So in hospitals uh, and certainly in ICU units, they are often giving antibiotics as well. Mm -hmm. But an antibiotic will absolutely not uh, reduce your risk of getting flu because mm -hmm. it's not a bacterial infection, it's a viral infection. And a virus is smaller than bacteria, is it? The, the, the particles are just much smaller or is that no, not it's relevant? Not, it just, it's not really relevant, it okay. just you know, operates in a, very, in a very different way. I think the biggest difference is what a virus does is it has to in, invade your cells, take over, insert its RNA or DNA message, insert its code, and then it gets your cells to make more viruses. Right. Now, bacteria doesn't work like that. Okay. That's a very different mechanism. Great answer. Thank you very, very much. Uh, how do viruses work and where are their weaknesses? Well, we've just explained how they work. They take over the cell. Uh, yes. but, but a good question, I guess. What are their weaknesses? How do we beat them? Oh. There are many. The first thing, obviously, is to reduce your exposure by washing your hands and all that, you know, and so on. That, that, of course, that helps because if you have less virus particles coming into you, the immune system has a better chance to respond. The first layer of defense is actually your skin and your mucous membranes, the membrane of your nose and your lungs and so on. And we know that both vitamin A and vitamin C actually make that mucous membrane strong. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of number one. Number two, the immune system is designed to identify a virus quickly and fight it off and kill it. And the critical nutrients that do that are vitamin C, uh, zinc, and vitamin D. So those three nutrients uh, would allow your immune system to be more uh, immediately reactive and responsive. Now, if a virus actually gets inside your cells and starts to multiply, uh, you start to 
produce a lot of what we call oxidants. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's where vitamin C in high doses really comes in because it is an antioxidant, mm -hmm. uh, which mops up and uh, all these very, very dangerous oxidants. So there's a sort of process as a virus, as a viral infection continues where you get more inflammation, which means pain and producing more mucus and um, you know fever and and so on and at that level if you can whack in um, antioxidants we're seeing a nice chart here vitamin c vitamin e glutathione you know we're talking about eating carrots and fruit and veg and nuts and seeds and so on um, but the single most important nutrient in this stage of a virus viral infection is incredibly high doses of vitamin C. I want to stress here that if you're a goat, my body weight makes 15 grams of vitamin C a day, and one gram is 20 oranges worth. If you expose that goat to a virus or to stress, there's a very important point here about stress we could explore, it will triple its production of vitamin C. Yeah. So uh, please understand that when you are under viral attack significantly, the body is consuming, losing, and using up vitamin C in its defense strategy. And it's a little bit like, you know, if you've got a few policemen wandering around the streets, you know, that's enough. But if you're in a war and you suddenly need a thousand soldiers, uh, you're in a war in a viral attack and you don't just need, you know, 100 milligrams of vitamin C, which is what you can get, you know, pretty much in an orange. You need a thousand milligram every hour that's great and advice. All animals make this. All animals do this, except for very few primates, which includes us, the fruit-eating um, bats, uh, the bulbul bird, guinea pigs. And they all, these animals cannot make vitamin C, makes them more susceptible to certain viruses and also to cancer. So if you are under viral attack, you need one gram of vitamin C every hour. The worst that can happen to you is you go to the loo a bit more frequently. Yeah. It's, it's as dangerous as that. Also, uh, you taught me something called the ORAC scale, which I wrote in my latest book, uh, which is foods that are rich in antioxidants. So trying to get plenty of those into our diet, trying to, let me just get my glasses on, uh, you know, getting cinnamon, uh, Oregon, turmeric, uh, cumin seeds, uh, curry powder, sage, thyme, anything high on the ORAC scale, that's going to help us with our defense, is it? Well, it totally is. And there's actually... Um, uh, uh, I mean, like blueberries, fantastic. I use a blueberry concentrate. I don't know if you've ever had that blueberry active. It's very, very nice. I don't really have fruit juice because it's too much sugar, but I do have a shot of this concentrate. But also red onions, rather than white, red onions, are very rich in something called quercetin. And quercetin is actually being used in America in ICU units. Okay. It's very, very powerful and very safe. Uh, anti-inflammatory. So, for example, uh, Professor Paul Marrick at East Virginia Medical School, everybody in hospital is given quercetin. It's a very inexpensive, very safe supplement. Now, the point here, I'll make the same point. A red onion will give you 20 milligrams, but if you're under viral attack, you need maybe 500 milligrams, possibly even that twice a day. So, we're talking 20 red onions. Right. So, when you're sick, sometimes food alone is just not enough to get you well. Brilliant, thank you for that. Um, yesterday uh, on the screen live, Sheila Smith asked me a question, but I didn't get around to answer it. Why do GPs not tend to recommend supplements as treatments for a whole range of things? Because they know nothing about it. I yeah. mean, uh, to give you an example, a friend of mine was at Oxford University um, Medical School, which is rated as you know in the top five in the world. And uh, they were given a lecture on diabetes and the lecturer said, uh, at the end of it, there was about, I think, seven minutes on nutrition. And the lecturer said, by the way, that is all the nutrition you're getting in your medical training. Yeah. So, you know, the, the vast majority of doctors have absolutely zero idea about vitamin C research, vitamin D research, zinc, et cetera, et cetera. And I think their knee-jerk reaction, and don't forget, you know, unfortunately, we, you know, we have a medical mafia. It's as simple as that, a medical pharmaceutical mafia. It's a terrible thing. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's been going on for a long time. And I hope in my lifetime something changes. But the bottom line is the pharmaceutical industry fund medicine. Yeah. 
So they're fed all these messages, which literally do not stand up to uh, to the evidence at all. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that vitamin C is a waste of time. And I think it's, isn't it, it's important, isn't it, Patrick, that we say it's not the doctor's fault or the nurse's fault. It's just the system's fault, because if in five years at medical school, you have literally less than a day on nutrition. It's not the doctor's fault. It's just the system fault. We are the National Hospital Service. We're not the National Health Service. We're not about prevention. We're about brilliant cure and brilliant treatment and brilliant hospital hospitalization. It's the system that's wrong. And here's a really important point. Uh, most pharmaceuticals advertising budget, and, and I've read this in so many different articles that I hope this is true, but I've read that most advertising budget from all the pharmaceutical companies isn't aimed at us the public it's aimed at the doctors and the medical industry because if they can brainwash the doctors in saying the actual cure is medicine and not vitamins then they've won the war because if that's what doctors believe well, then then that, you know that's what we believe. I agree with you but I do think that doctors have to take responsibility because they've chosen to go into a profession um, they apparently want to practice evidence-based medicine. They've got access to exactly the same journals uh, that I've got access to. And tomorrow you're going to have a smart doctor, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick. And uh, by the way, I'll send him that, that study designed to stitch up uh, hydroxychloroquine and vitamin C and see what he says. And he has just looked at the science and made up his own mind. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's important. There is no doctor here who could not simply go on to the library of research is called PubMed, they all know it, and look up vitamin C, look up vitamin D, look up zinc, you know, it, it's all there. Now, I think probably a, a more valid argument, really, as to why it's not happening, is because, you know, as funding has reduced and reduced and reduced, the average doctor has just got so much to do, um, they can no longer innovate, uh, the system discourages that, and gradually what's happened, uh, and they've got no money to do their own trials, they've got no, um, uh, you, you know, they're not allowed to sort of think out of the box and try to work things out. And as a consequence, we've ended up in, you know, it's a shame, but we've got this monolithic uh, organization, the NHS, which I absolutely love. I mean, in a sense, it should be the most perfect thing, uh, but it's just ended up with these incredibly... Uh, you know, controlled set of rules. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's been controlled by a very, very clever um, industry, you yeah. know. And and so it's it's a bit of everything, really. But I do urge, you know, any GP, I would love, I love to be attacked. You know, I'm having it every day on Facebook. By the way, we're posting today at 12 o'clock uh, something on vaccines. And then tomorrow we're posting something on lockdown. I please you know, disagree with me entirely, challenge me. I'll show you the science, make yeah. up your own mind. Because, you know, if you can't make up your own mind, yeah. you can. Yeah, that's brilliant. Right, should we go and answer? We've got so many people want to ask you questions. Uh, let's go to the top of the list and work our way down. Um, uh, uh, Steve from Norma, is there any advantage having skimmed milk opposed to semi-skim milk if you're gonna have milk have film full milk <laughs> that's yeah, my no, advice no, go for the full milk because then you get all the fats yeah and that's where you get the vitamin d and the omegas and all that sort of stuff and there's nothing wrong with fat you know we've demonized fat so no if you're gonna drink milk drink the whole thing yeah um in fact other people are answering that question uh, full fat milk is best uh, is there a difference between vitamin d from the sun and supplements says alba no, uh, it's the same thing. So the sun does make vitamin D. There are two forms of vitamin D, D2 and D3. And D3 is what you find in animals. It's actually usually extracted from the oil in the wool of sheep. So if you, if you wear woolly jumpers, but you're a vegetarian, then don't worry. But nowadays for the vegans, they're making the animal form, vitamin D3, from lichen. So you can get a, a, a and that's slightly better than the D2. But it's the same stuff that's made in the sun uh, or made by the sun, which acts uh, on cholesterol in the skin. Uh, the sun is the most significant root of us getting vitamin D. Uh, and the big problem in Britain is from October to March, the angle of the sun is not enough. And again, I saw a very nice letter in The Guardian from a GP who made the obvious point, because everyone's talking about why the 
um, sort of black African Asian uh, you know communities seem to be having a higher rate of uh, COVID-19 um, you know deaths and you know there is there is I mean there's something to do with an ACE2 receptor that everyone's focusing on but there is a very very simple thing the darker your skin the less vitamin D you make in the presence of sunlight so to, to, to make an example, if you emigrate uh, with very dark skin, let's say from Africa to the UK, and you go and live somewhere very far north, like Scotland, and um, let's just say you happen to be Muslim, and you're a woman, and uh, you therefore, your religion, uh, you know, encourages you to be reasonably covered up. And also you live indoors, especially because you're locked down and not allowed outdoors. Um, and it's between October and March. You don't have a chance in hell of making vitamin D. And that is why we're actually seeing in people with darker skin a return of rickets uh, where your bones start to deform from a lack of vitamin D. So we all need vitamin D during the winter to supplement it. In the summer, I think it's still a good idea to supplement, but you want to get out. Every day I'm getting out now and taking my kit off, not all of it, um, you know, I've got neighbors, um, but, you know, and I'm keeping at least two meters away, so uh, I'm, I won't be accused of anything. But I, I literally, you know, will take my T-shirt off or I'm wearing shorts today, actually. I will expose as much of my skin to direct sunlight, you know, for a half an hour or so uh, will actually produce vitamin D. We are designed to be naked, living outdoors and a lot further south than the UK. So the answer there is... All vitamin D, well, D3 is vitamin D3. Um, but the key thing is get out in the sun. Um, question from Andrew Hunt. Pure and essential vegan omega-3 uh, algae oil, DHA, EPA. Uh, that's, uh, I can't quite understand that question. I'm going to move on from that. Um, well, I can, I can kind of help there. I mean, okay. the, the bottom line, there are two, there are two essential fats in omega-3, EPA and DHA. And uh, if you buy a fish oil supplement, for example, and you look at the small print, it will say EPA and DHA. And EPA is anti-inflammatory, and some of it will convert to DHA, which builds your brain. This is really important. I mean, to, to illustrate this, there was a study in Aberdeen in Scotland where they took uh, uh, pregnant women and they measured the level of DHA omega-3 in the birth in the umbilical cord at birth. And it correlated with the speed of thinking of the child at the age of eight. Wow. Right? You've got to get DHA, and you will not make DHA from flax uh, or from uh, chia seeds. You've got to, animals make DHA. It's in organ meats, it's in some meats, especially meats of colder climates, because it's the cold water fish that eat fish that have the highest DHA. DHA literally builds your brain. Uh, we won't go into the whole story, but we actually became human because we had a period of time when we split from the primates, the monkeys, about six million years ago. And what happened was we became a semi-aquatic ape. We started wading, standing up, eating seafood. We had a very, very, very high marine food diet. T to illustrate that, in uh, the Gower Peninsula in Wales, they discovered a 40,000-year-old Homo sapiens. And when they did uh, 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 tests, um, they, they found that one quarter of their diet was um, seafood. Now, they would have expended at least double, if not triple, the calories through exercise, hunting, gathering, and so on that we do today. So in other words, they were eating two or three times more than we were eating. So what that means is to, to achieve the level of omega-3 that our ancestors were achieving today would require half of your diet to be seafood. Right. Right. So if you are, if you do choose to be vegetarian or vegan, and of course we don't have that much fish in the sea, um, then you need to supplement. Doesn't matter if it's a vegan source of DHA because they're now making it very well from algal oil, algae. And by the way, in case you didn't know, algae um, algae is seaweed. Seaweed um, has roots and attaches, and algae floats. So algae and seaweed are the same thing. One is attached and one is floating. And you can make DHA from that. You've got to get DHA without. D I mean, I'll give you an example here. Um, uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, grandkids, you know, in in my extended family, uh, was having temper tantrums. You know, suddenly just burst into anger. And I said, "You've just got to give 
uh, them omega-3 supplements. Yeah. And within yeah. maybe 48 hours of having omega-3 supplements, the temper tantrums reduced. So DHA affects emotionality. So if you've got a toddler and you think it's the terrible twos and they keep just losing their rag, um, you have to give children omega-3 supplements containing DHA. And it is amazing how fast you will find that they calm down and their concentration is better because you cannot build a healthy brain without omega-3 DHA. Another day we'll, do, we'll talk about the experiment you did in Wales with a, a group of children where it was uh, omega-3 and vitamin B, but we're running out of time. Rob Southall says, uh, hi both, I've ordered vitamin C, vitamin D and zinc. I'll now order vitamin B12. Is there anything else I should take on a daily basis? Well, you may not need B12. I mean, if you're older, the chances are you do. That, that's important. You know, the high dose B12 for preventing dementia. Everyone should have at least 10 micrograms and a decent multivitamin. So, I mean, to, you know, to tell you what I take, I take a multivitamin and mineral every day, twice a day, because a lot of these B vitamins and vitamin C, they're in and out. So I have one pill multivitamin. I wish I, I, I can't show you because I've taken it. Um, I take an additional one gram of vitamin C and it's got extra zinc in it. So my vitamin C has extra zinc. And I also take an omega-3 supplement. Um, so I take three things and I take them twice a day. And that is a very, very good base. Um, anything else is extra. Uh, so we don't all need to be taking high dose B12. It's not harmful if you do, uh, but there is a blood test called homocysteine. Uh, you might never have heard of that word. Think of Gay Chapel and you might remember it. Homocysteine. Um, I hope that's not too non-PC, but basically your doctor can run a homocysteine test and if your level is high, then you are not um, uh, absorbing B12 properly, then you need to take high dose B12. Get informed. I've got a website, patchcolfer.com. There's loads of stuff on there. Uh, do go to my Facebook because we're going to be talking about vaccines today uh, on the post there so you can ask your questions. I'll also post that study I was talking about. So if some of you want some backup, you know, you say, where's the evidence for this? Just go on a Facebook post it. Tomorrow we're doing a whole post on, is lockdown really necessary? So that's going to be an interesting conversation. And I, the most important thing is that we are meant to be living in a free society uh, where we have some choice. Uh, so don't let your choice be eroded with mandatory vaccines. And don't let your ability to speak uh, be eroded because a lot of that has been happening during this pandemic that we're not even allowed to talk about these things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Alba says, apart from vitamin C for an intervention perspective, why should we supplement? Early humans did not supplement. Um, well, I think the uh, there's a couple of issues there. So number one, a gorilla gets 4.5 grams a day. And number two, a smaller monkey will get between one and two grams a day. So I think you're wrong. I think that early humans actually were achieving an intake of vitamin C that was probably at least a gram a day. And what you've got to remember is, is basically it all changed once we got um, fridges and cars. So before, if you go back just 200 years ago, and by the way, of course, people died of scurvy, they died of pneumonia, they died of infections, they died you know, of quite a few vitamin C deficiency diseases. But before we got fridges and cars, um, all our food was organic, all our food was whole, we couldn't store it, so we had to eat it fresh. Um, because we had to chop the wood and fetch the water, uh, the average Greek in Crete, for example, was walking seven miles a day. We ate double the amount of food that we are eating today. Uh, that's terribly important. And if you actually look at what we were eating, even there was a study on this in mid-Victorian workers' diet. So, you know, we think of this as pretty shit times, you know, when you're a, a worker, you know, in London in those times. But if you wanted to achieve the same intake of omega-3, B vitamins, vitamin C, zinc, that a, a worker in Victorian times was eating today, you would have to supplement because they ate so much more and the food had to be whole and it had to be fresh. There was no refining, there was no refrigeration. And that the simple reason why we need to supplement today is because we don't eat enough. And the reason we don't eat enough is we don't have to. Our whole life is push button. You know, if you run a marathon a day and you eat the food that you need to support that uh, calorie expenditure and you eat it all whole and all fresh and unrefined, probably you don't need to supplement.
That's great advice. So the food was real food throughout history. We've only been eating artificial food for the last 60, 70 years. Um, we were eating more. So we were eating so much wholesome, real, natural food, much, much more because we needed to, because our expenditure was higher. It was all real food. And of course, we weren't battling against things that we battle against today. You know, there was no carbon dioxide poisoning from vehicles. There was no lead. There was, there, there was, no, uh, yes, so there was no sugar-loaded nonsense in the food. So we're battling against more things. We're battling against toxins and potions and lotions on our skin. So we're in a different environment. We're not eating as much. And what we are eating isn't as wholesome as it used to be. And also, when we talk about zinc and magnesium, and, and the minerals coming out of the soil, because we haven't done agriculture properly since the Second World War, where we used to rotate crops, we're not getting the minerals that we once got out of the ground. So I, I totally get the question, and my book's all about living primal and trying to be you know, as uh, in, in tune with nature as possible, but the fact is, we, you know, we do everything, we should do everything we, that we primarily used to do, but we have to supplement today just because of where we are. But also, this gentleman on my left, the twice, twice Nobel Prize winner, 48 PhDs, Linus Pauling, what he noticed, and the reason why he got interested in vitamin C, and the reason why I studied with him from back in the 80s, he noticed that us humans have an incredibly high rate of cancer. In fact, one in th the lifetime risk of cancer now is one in three. He also noticed that we suffer from viral diseases like colds and flu. And he noticed that animals that make vitamin C don't. Um, so he figured that, that 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 shift in our ability to make vitamin C was an evolutionary disadvantage. And that is why we're having this conversation today about flu, about COVID and so on. And please, Linus Pauling's research is absolutely phenomenal. My book, FluFighters.net, which, by the way, the Flu Fighters has gone to number two hottest releases on Amazon Kindle. And... After this show, sometime today, I'm being delivered the physical paperback copies. Awesome. So you can order it. And it's very cheap. I've tried to make it cheap because I want it to go out to everyone. It's nine. Well, I, I downloaded it this morning, £3.99. Yeah, exactly. And you've got this free sample chapter, chapter nine. Uh, please take the time just to get educated, to learn about these things, because it literally could save your life, prolong your life, add years to your life and life to your years. I love that. That's a great, great statement. Thank you for that. Let's go to some more questions. Uh, Andrew Hunt has just said, signed and shared your petition for vitamin C for all health workers. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Caroline says, uh, please don't generalize this for all vaccine. Influence is entirely different to other pathogens. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, th I think there's an important point perhaps behind this. You see, the reason we don't have an HIV vaccine, uh, and we've been, you know, I mean, how many years has it been since mid 80s? No HIV vaccine. It's called a retrovirus. And it's, it's a very complex thing. So we haven't managed to make a retrovirus vaccine. So, um, but smallpox was very simple, you know, and straightforward. Uh, so it does depend on the infectious, infectious agent. Yeah. So you absolutely can have a very effective, 100% effective um, vaccine that is safe against some organisms. But you mustn't assume that that is going to be true for all. What we know about flu is it's forever mutating. And that's why every year um, the flu vaccine is a combination based on the best guess of which strains are coming our way. Wow. Uh, and that's why it's not 100% effective. Well, one of the reasons, because we don't know what's coming our way. I guarantee you um, that we are going to see another COVID-19, except it won't be called COVID-19 because it'll be COVID-23 or it'll be something else. So viruses are mutating all the time. So the big problem with vaccines is they are reactive. In other words, you can't even start to make one until you've got the new mutated virus and that is why you've got to look at a different strategy as well and that is how to boost the body's own natural immune system that is not vaccine specific so there is not a single virus known to man not a single virus known to man that has been tested against high dose vitamin c that has worked now one guy on my facebook yesterday said you know what a load of bollocks you know, I'm unfriending you, I'm following whatever. And I just said, just please 
tell me, you know, more specifically, you know, in what way have I offended you, so to speak. Anyway, he didn't go. I'm glad he didn't. And then he said, because there was one statement, which you'll see in this book as well, that in, in cell studies where they took human T cells, infected them with HIV, the AIDS virus, and uh, exposed those cells to an amount of vitamin C, which they had proven to be completely non-toxic. And this was Linus Pauling's research. Um, there was a greater than 99% complete inactivation of the HIV virus, right? Anyway, he said, look, we know vitamin C is good. I accept it, but don't go telling me, you know, that vitamin C can, can inactivate the AIDS virus. I mean, you know, come on, get a life. So I, I said, I understand why you might have that view. And I sent him all the studies with a direct click on the link. And then I realized it's quite hard for Joe Bloggs to read the language of this. For immunologists out there, you measure something called reverse transcriptase. And in this study, it was a 99.8% inactivation of the HIV virus. Now, that was in a cell study. It's not a human study. But what I'm trying to tell you here is that there is phenomenally strong science on this. It's been there for a very, very, very long time. It may blow your mind, you know, because we all have beliefs. We're all stuck in a certain box. We haven't been taught about nutrition at school, you know, so we're really taught through the messages we get in the media. Um, please read this book, you know, get informed, click on the studies if you want to search it out for yourself do post as awkward and horrible questions as you wish on Facebook. Um, I, I am a man of science. I don't say things unless the science is there. And, um, you know, let's just open this up. It may be that there are many angles of attack for this COVID-19 pandemic and, you know, boosting your immune system, maybe vaccines, maybe there'll be some good drugs. You know, this, um, you know, lockdown clearly has been effective. How long we need to do it now is a question. Uh, you know, that needs some considerable thought and debate, you know, do wash your hands, do exercise, do get in the sun, you know, but take charge of your own health because it's your health and, uh, you know, take some time to learn about your health and what you can do for yourself. And it, it, it is all about constant learning, isn't it? One of the things I really love and admire about you, you've written over 40 books and some of your early books, some of the things I, I read, oh, I'm not quite sure about that. But then, you know, like then your hybrid diet, which I think is a Bible for health. I mean, this is one of the best books I've ever read. You're ever so open-minded about changing your opinion based on research, research, research. And that's what I want to see more of from people that we rely on, because there seems to be this, I've got a hypothesis, I'll stick to it to the day I die because I look stupid if I change my mind. Whereas what you're brilliant at, you take the latest research and you're happy to change opinion as long as the research supports that. I've taken way too much of your time today. You've been absolutely brilliant as always. I'm so proud of you that your book's gone straight to, to number two. That's great, great, great news. I encourage everybody to go and get uh, Flu Fighters and uh, let's catch up again shortly, my friend. Stay well. You're doing a great job. Thank you, Patrick. And don't forget to put some money in the Primal 20, Primal 10, Primal 5. Put some money in the food bank. Yeah. The starting point is food. There are people out there who simply don't have enough food. That's really good. Thank you very much for, for plugging that. We'll, we'll recap that as well. That was the brilliant Patrick Holford. Uh, his books are all worth, worthy of a read. This one, I tell you, was from... Once you understand going low carb, how that loses weight. Once you get your weight where you need to go, then there is a slightly different thought on sort of the beliefs that, that we hold. Um, and it's brilliant. It's just really fascinating read. And as Patrick just said, if you can make a donation after today's show or right now on your mobile phone, uh, you simply text the number, well, text 70085, the word 70450. Oh, sorry, my son's waving at me. I've got the wrong number. 70450. Text that number with the word uh, primal space and then the amount that you'd like to donate. That'd be great. Or if you can go to just giving, uh, my family and I, we're going to pound for pound match your donations all the way up to £100,000. We're so keen to support the food banks across the UK. And it really is, you know, together we need to put a meal on everybody's table this evening. And because of two things have happened since the lockdown, less people putting the food into the collection boxes means less food to go around. 
and those brilliant volunteers that work in the community centres that have for many, many years given up lots of their time to hand out the food parcels. Because of distancing, they've just not been able to go into those community centres. So uh, the Trussell Trust are having to organise lots of home deliveries at the moment. So they need two things. They need you and I, when we go into that supermarket for our daily, for our weekly shop, to get the cans of fish, to get the cans of vegetables, and UHT milk is the thing they're really lacking at the moment. And please put them into the collection boxes together. We need to be doing that. And there's a list of, uh, almost right, can't even twist my hand right. Uh, there's a list of things we could be donating. But because of their operating costs have gone up, it is a registered charity, this is a not-for-profit organisation, the Trussell Trust, they need our cash. And every little bit we can give will help. Asda have donated a fortune to them and we, we applaud you, Asda, for that. Uh, Liam Page, the singer, has made a huge donation as well. Uh, my family are doing a small bit uh, as, as much as we can. We ask you to join in the campaign as well and donate. Uh, to the Trussell Trust and together we'll make sure there's a meal on the table for as many people across the UK as we can this evening. That was great wasn't it from uh, Patrick uh, Holford, um, great views, great opinions, uh, keep taking the vitamin C. Tomorrow we have a great doctor on, uh, his name um, uh, is Malcolm Patrick and no it's not. <laughs> It's been a long, 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 long day. The gentleman, it's I've got... It's Don, 11 o'clock. It's 11 o'clock. I know I've got to move on. Uh, uh, the great cholesterol con is not by Malcolm Patrick. It's Malcolm Kendrick. And I've got all his books to share with you tomorrow. But we're talking about doctoring data. He's done so much research on how newspaper headlines are crafted. We're going to talk about whether the trials are randomised, whether they're interventional, uh, what type of measurements they're using, what statistics they're using, what's the life expectancy. And we're going to cut through all the nonsense tomorrow. It's called Doctoring Data. Do join me and my family tomorrow. Thank you for taking part today.